Everybody get up! Welcome back to the Lance Robert Show podcast today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Our special guest today, Danielle DiMartino Booth. Of course, she is the CEO of Quill Intelligence and the author of The Daily Feather. Danielle, uh, we've talked about a lot of stuff today in regards to the Fed. Of course, that is your bailiwick since you used to actually work with the Dallas Fed for a long time. Um, you know, one of the things that has been interesting lately is we've seen a lot of the uh, lieutenants of Jerome Powell out into the media talking, giving speeches, etc. cetera, uh, both uh, Lael Brainerd as, as well as Richard Clarita, uh, you know, talking about different aspects of things that may be done or possibly could be done in the event uh, of another crisis or recession. One of those issues is, or, or one of those topics was the idea of targeting yield rather than doing you know, straight up QE where they say we're going to do a billion plus uh, in, in bond buying or a trillion in, in bond buying. Um, we're going to target a specific yield. We'll buy until we hit that specific yield and then we'll stop. Um, this was something we haven't seen since World War II. It's something that Japan has tried to do. Um, in both cases, it really didn't seem to work out that well. I kind of want to get your thoughts on it. Well, the, the problem is, and you can go ask uh, uh, Kuroda over at the Bank of Japan, <laughs> Uh, you have to have a pool of assets into which you can buy sufficient amounts and not be competing with, by the way, what we were just talking about, pensions and other mm -hmm. natural holders who want to own out those longer dated treasuries. So you know, I, I see that the, that the slope could be very slippery of the Fed running out of, because presumably it would be the tenure. Right. Brainerd actually said she, she could come out initially and say, we'll target the one year, we'll, we'll target the two year. But as Japan has shown us, that is a very slippery slope to trying to get at, as a central bank, the rates um, off of which we actually borrow, which is mm -hmm. a little bit longer term. And the reason I think that we have seen unintentional, unwanted, unwelcome tapering on the part of the Bank of Japan is that they have, in, in, in this endeavor to control the interest rate, they haven't had enough to buy. So they've, they've actually tapered against their will, and it's not something that I can see being necessarily feasible here. And what worries me is that the Fed could be, you know, just, just imagine, you know, a, an octopus with lots of arms flying around <laughs> that they could possibly be in a few years doing conventional, conventional, I can't believe I just said conventional QE, that they could be doing QE as we know it and possibly trying to target interest rates next. Right. And if that doesn't right. work, then we're going to have to save the pension. So we'll, we'll buy municipal bonds, what, at auction, straight from the governor of Illinois. Of Illinois. And, and that leads us to the slippery slope of stocks. Again, they, I, I think one of the, the chief difficulties with academics keying off of models is that they can convince themselves that anything is possible. Bernanke told us with a straight face that the Federal Reserve would never monetize the debt. Well, and he told us with that same straight face that b their models explained to them that when the time came, they would be able to fully exit all of the purchases of securities made during the emergency QE era. Well, guess what? We will be monetizing every single penny that the Fed cannot roll off of their balance sheet once QT, once quantitative tightening has concluded. Right. Every penny after that that could not be rolled off is true debt monetization. I have been beating on this drum. My only point is you can have the best laid out plan in the world, but execution is not the Fed's strong point. It's not any central banker's strong point. The more you impede upon markets' ability to set rates that they naturally should be setting, the more difficult it is to execute fun, new, fancy plans that look great on a whiteboard. You know, you bring up a really great point. I mean, you use some big words in here that, you know, people listening to our, our podcast are going to go, I'm not really sure what she just said. You talk about monetizing debt and we talk about targeting, you know, uh, economic cycles. You know, one of the, 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 the questions I've always had is, why is the Fed so terribly afraid of recessions? And, you know, to... They will go to any length, it seems, to avoid having a downturn in the economy. And I say this, you know, from the standpoint that recessions are actually a good thing. If we had recessions, 
on a more frequent basis. You would keep from having these excesses and bubbles in the markets. And so, yeah, you'd have some slow periods where the Fed could be effective at helping to, you know, to, to slow the rate of recession and to, to get the economy through it. But by trying to avoid them altogether, we keep building these boom and bust cycles. Do you think the Fed is, is, is mis, I, I shouldn't say misguided, but do you think they're missing the, the target here of trying to avoid recessions entirely? You know, I do. Uh, it was interesting to hear Jerome Powell in his latest press conference cite the example of Australia when asked the question, can the U.S. economy continue to expand indefinitely? Mm -hmm. That scared the heck out of me. Of course, Australia has not gone into a recession. A, their central bank never went to the zero bound. They're completely rational people. But B, they've been They've been growing because China has been growing and they're an, a, an exporting nation to China and mm -hmm. it's a symbiotic relationship and there's no way that Australia could have gone into recession. We're not we're not Australia. Right. And right. and as, as a factor of time over the past 30 years, the, the majority of which Australia has not been in recession, instead of making our economy more self-reliant, every boom and bust cycle, every time the Fed has tried to come out and say that the, that the, they've eradicated the business cycle, has been predicated on pushing our economy to be more dependent upon consumption, more dependent upon financialization, all of which, all of which fails completely if households and corporations even step back from taking on debt, if, if companies stop buying back their share and, and, and monkeying with their balance sheets via financial engineering. This is a monster of the Fed's creation, and they don't know how to escape from this vicious cycle that they have created by making us a nation that depends on debt to create prosperity. So um, I got a couple minutes left here uh, with our time together, and I've appreciated your time as always today. I know you're very busy, so we appreciate you spending a little bit with us. Um, anything I forgot to ask you or any important points that uh, we should make? You know, I, I think that 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 what investors should pay the most attention to now is is the quality of the economic data. We've seen, you know, in, in the last payroll report, 65% of the jobs were in low paying industries. Be very careful about what you listen to uh, about, uh, you know, on financial bubble vision, major media type networks, because what you're looking at is not necessarily what the economy is getting. We didn't have a, a good 3.2% GDP report because it's make up. And the 49 year low in the unemployment rate is not necessarily a bad thing. But again, look at the composition of the workforce and look at how many millions of Americans cannot even access unemployment insurance in order to make that initial jobless claims weekly number go up. Right. These are the things we write about every day at Quill Intelligence so that you're not sideswiped and taken by surprise by a big reversal in the economic data. Well, that's because, you know, you at Quill Intelligence and me here at Real Investment Advice, we write this stuff and people go, ah, oh, you're just being bearish. <laughs> but the point is, is understanding the facts so that you're absolutely there's right. About, there's nothing bearish about reporting pure data. Absolutely. Nothing bearish about it at all. And, and you know what? And, 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 and at the point that it matters, it matters a whole lot. Danielle, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate you as always. And, uh, you know, best of luck to you. You're doing awesome. We'll have you back here soon on, the, on another edition of the Lance Roberts Show podcast right here at realinvestmentadvice.com. You can get daily real investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the Internet. Sign up for Lance's newsletter now at realinvestmentadvice.com.